Welcome to this conversation with Gabby Gonzalez. We are deeply honored to have you in the room. Again, Gabby, bring your wisdom around chromatography and chromodynamics, and we cannot wait to learn more about that today. And I just wanna say a big thank you and a big shout out to everybody who's making it live because the, I know that everyone has full days and full schedules and for you to carve out the time and space to come into the room to celebrate 100 years of biodynamics with us and to learn from a dynamic wisdom keeper in, and student of biodynamics in the space is, um, is, is really special and we deeply appreciate your presence and the questions that you are bringing to the table today and the um, the wisdom that you have to share here as well as a learner and a steward of life and nature so thank you for joining us and um, i'm excited about this conversation because chromatography is something that's always fascinated me i think since i was um i want to say a little girl uh because it reminds me of when i was a little girl and dropping um water droplets and colors on paper and watching them like spread out and make designs and and so it lights me up in a really magical way and so i'm really excited to learn more about chromatography and what what we can learn about the soil and the land that we're growing our foods in and how we can even use it in relationship to the plants that we're growing and and then permadynamics is something that i don't know if you've heard very much about i know it's kind of a a newer word to me in the, with the integration of perma, per, the permaculture and biodynamics together. So we're gonna learn about how Gabby has been practicing that in her space and in her practices as a composter and soil scientist and um, the founder of, and I, I'm i sorry, Gabby, I'm not very good at saying your company's name, Earth, Earth Kutchera, <laughs> say it for me. It's like architecture, so you Earth can... Architecture, thank yeah. you. So Earth Architecture, it's such a cool name. She's an architect as well. So Earth, <laughs> Earth, 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 say it again? <laughs> Earth Architectura, it's in Spanish, but then if you want to mix it with the English words, so it's Earth and Architecture, so it's just Earth Architecture. Earth Architecture. It's like the first time I ever said glyphosate, it was a tongue twister as well, so might take me a few years, but I'll get it. I promise I'll get it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's complicated. Yeah, but it kind of resonated with me. So that's yeah. why. So, so thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Gabby. And I'm just, I'm curious, before we jump into chromatography and permadynamics, I just want to um, ask you, what is, uh, like, what's on your heart in these days of what is really important to you and um, your relationship with the soil and the land and what you're learning? Well, Natalie and Leslie, first of all, I'm delighted to be back here with you guys and all these beautiful people that uh, could join us today. So thank you all for your time and and lending me my your, your ears for listening. It's amazing to have you here and to be here sharing all this with you. Uh, for this special event of the 100 years of biodynamics. And uh, what's actually in my heart right now is what life has been teaching me through my 40 years of life in this, in this, on this planet. I get the chance to start uh, my project, my life project in this area, in this land that I'm in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, in the Zemai Desert. So it's a very harsh territory. No, it's a very uh, complicated, tough, and uh, but incredibly amazing and uh, surprising land as well. So I've been just staying observant of how this land has talked to me, no? And uh, trying to learn what this uh, biodiversity is telling me to do with it and how can I actually be part of it so it's been a couple of years since I'm starting this project uh, that I moved in here and that I'm building my house that I'm starting to work barely from scratch with uh, with this land no so it's been so to say uh, 
slowing down period of my of my life, but where I have been able to actually, how do you say that? Like verse everything that I am into what I can see, feel, sense um in this in this land no that i can actually be able what i can actually be what i can i actually be able to do in this in this area and uh, with this project so i've been working with the land in order to harvest water because it's a semi desert so we just had two rains last year in the in the rainy season two rains no like wow. an hour an hour of rain in the whole year so but we got to get some water in our pond, in our big, uh, it's a big, big, um, uh, yeah, pond that we just built. So we're doing little by little. And uh, this is a project that it will take me forever in order to start actually doing agriculture now, because I'm not in an area that I can actually take advantage of it right away. So this has been really powerful for my insight. And it's been really like the challenge of why biodynamics have been here for for a hundred years. What can I what can I do with it? What is telling me to do, and how can I approach a land such as this, uh, doing this this work that I've um, come to this point in my life now? So mm -hmm. this is pretty much what is in my heart right now. And thank you for asking that, Natalie. Yeah, that's so powerful because I think a lot of us. Um... A lot of us are very blessed with rich soil to grow our food in. And um, and even when we're blessed with that rich soil, sometimes the all of a sudden it's not growing the foods that we want it to grow. And yeah. so we're having to start from a place of replenishing the soil. And then there's more and more people who are buying land or inheriting land or um, buying their their first house and um, they're finding that what you're finding that the soil is just not what it needs to be to be growing something and so to be in the room with somebody with the experience that you have who's starting with tired soil and a desert like soil and to witness you actually bringing that soil to life is really it's really powerful and I think we have a lot to learn from that experience both from um, a personal growth perspective and then also with our hands in the soil like how how can we do this and and if you can do it if you are approaching this Gabby I know every single person in the room can yes. do it and that's the powerful thing no that's the powerful uh possibility of of being communicating being right now here together no like yeah to share all these experiences for sure yeah, yeah. So thank you for championing that and taking that on to show us what's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Gabby, before we you have a presentation for us, which I'm really excited to see some of your pictures and slides. And before we jump into that, can you tell us what chromatography is? Because I think it's probably new to a lot of people in the room. So what is it and how do we use it? Yeah, something that I was amazed to hear you is like you know that since you were a child. Um, that, that, that's amazing. And uh, well, chromatography are the images of life. It's like taking a picture, you know, like a selfie <laughs> to, a, to a little sample of soil. And what do you see in that picture now? And in order to understand the relations that are in between uh, biodiversity with micro, my, microbia, uh, minerals, and uh, what does actually these relations in between those two are are doing no so those images of life is what I called chromatography tests or the images that I'm going to show you now. Uh, it's just a graphic representation of the interrelations of the parts that compose a living organism. You know whether if it's for it, for instance in a sample of soil you have the minerals, the microbiology, and everything that happens in between those these two and of course uh, oxygen if it's uh, aerobic or anaerobic, no, in the main scenario. So how all of these components of this um, living organism, which is microbia, minerals, oxygen, and everything that happens after mm -hmm. all that, no? 
Yeah. And so this is something that we can actually learn to do ourselves, right? Totally. Yeah. And this is something that I uh, would love to show or somehow in order to create a workshop later that we can share together or yes I'm yeah sure. so um we're gonna share and later on in the in the in the interview we're going to share with you how you can learn how to learn more about this from Gabby um and Gabby so we can do it at home and um which this is really cool because I I was at the AGM for the biodynamic BC uh, association yesterday and one of the soil scientists there said that he he took um, soil samples from a whole bunch of different current like uh, farms in the area in the BC area and um and and also so he, they noticed he noticed what he noticed about each of the ones and he said that my 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 parents farm my dad our family farm had the the most dynamic chromatography image which was really cool but what was really neat about what he learned from all the chromatography images is that he then took it um, and they were using it to like the images to decide on what land they were going to farm on so they were using it as a reference point so they were taking samples from different places on on the land to see which one was like which area of the 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 land was yeah to that's totally food. it's such a helpful tool for us farmers gardeners uh permaculturists everybody you now should mm -hmm. actually know or understand just as you know and see pictures of everything we could mm -hmm. just be able to recognize a good chroma out of what a bad chroma or whatever this picture is telling us now in order to recognize where our help our input as humans needs to be uh, oriented now and actually focused on because definitely we have all these types of uh, tests now for soil, yeah. chemical, physical, microbial, but it's all separate one from each other and it's just numbers in a in a sheet, no? So you definitely don't have like the possibility to understand those relationships. And then when you have a number like I don't know, just an example. 200 parts per uh, per mil, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, 200 partes por million, parts per million uh, of nitrogen in the in that piece of soil, it doesn't mean that the soil needs more at that moment because you are not actually seeing the whole picture. That's the whole important thing about chromatography, that it gives you the whole picture of what's going on in the soil and then our input as humans or our duty or our responsibility is actually to understand what this environment at that period of time when you took that sample is happening in that area. Now, if, if your plant is, is blooming, if your plant is fruiting, if your plant is just sprouting, it's very different the amount of nitrogen that that plant is going to need at every different period of its development. So. Mm -hmm we need to have that possibility to speak that language of the earth and in order to interpret it in a chroma in mm -hmm. order to see to see it in a chroma no mm -hmm. it's very cool gabby how about you go into your presentation because i feel like we could um actually take up all the time with all the questions and i know you have some really beautiful images to share with us so um to show us some pictures of what chromatography actually looks like and and how you use it and the beautiful. I just want to show you guys the way that I actually use chromatography for my work as a professional consultant for ranches or different uh, uh, um, agricultural projects, no? And uh, this is pretty much what my research through the time uh, has been no? in search of vitality, which is pretty much what we are, I think, or I believe most of us are always in search of. No? So mm -hmm. the path towards soil fertility regeneration through permadynamics, which is also the model or the way that I, um, yeah, the, 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 the way that I work with the uh, regenerating soil. It's using these different 
techniques of permaculture that I then apply biodynamics on. And uh, so the permadynamics is pretty much that word that Natalie was saying is uh, uh, very recently um, acquired, that cool. word. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is what I actually do. This is my model of regenerating soil. And then I use chromatography in order to understand where I am, where, where's my starting point and how it, the work that I'm doing is actually going. No, so I get to see the transformation of that soil through time. In this case, for instance, as I mentioned here, it's a high extensive agriculture asparagus ranch uh, near San Miguel de Allende, where I live. And um, we started with, this is the first chromatography that we started with, and uh, it's on 2018, on 20, the 20th of March of 2018. This is the first chroma when I barely first, uh, the first time that I went to the ranch, I took my sample, I did my chroma and I understood where I was. So it's a very deployed, very, yeah, sad image of there is no life or almost no life whatsoever since it's a very anaerobic. And then you can tell little by little, you are gonna be starting to understand what am I talking about? But this chroma actually tell me that there is no air because the center here in the center of the chroma, I can see that the, 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 the closeness and the tightness of that uh, possibility for oxygen to actually come into the, that stru structure is non-existent. And then the mineral area, which is the, I don't know if you guys can see my, my mouse. My, we can. Uh, yeah. So in the, in the outer, stone in this um, circle around here, we can see all the minerals. And then we don't have anything that actually waves, you know, or weaves the oxygen, which is non-existent, unfortunately, through this mineral realm, which are the microbes, the microbial uh, life that actually has to be there, who is the one that actually ingests those minerals and make, the, make them actually later available for plants, for roots, for growing, for life, in order for this mineral realm to become alive. No? So this is pretty much what vitality means in a soil. So here we have a very deployed uh, soil. And then in the outer part of the chroma, in this area here where are all these spikes, it's showing us that uh, the um, enzymatic activity of those microbes is non non-existent at all. No, it's just the spikes coming out out of nothing, and there is nothing making them glue together. You're gonna see that in a bit. How? What am I talking about? But then, what I can understand is that those little uh, white spikes that actually come through, like radius in this chroma here. It's telling me that those are microbes for sure. Yeah. That's the way that actually life as a microbial life actually shows itself in a chroma is through these lines, no? But what I'm seeing is that these lines, as you can tell, are very, very rigid, very straight. And uh, it's just one type of life that actually stays there without oxygen. So I can conclude that it's an anaerobic uh, type of life that actually is living in that soil. And uh, unfortunately, for agricultural soils in this first layer of soil, which is where I take my, my chroma samples always, uh, from the first 10 inches of uh, the layer of the soil, which is the layer that we as biodynamic agricultures or organic agricultures or people that is uh, into sustainable regeneration, we're gonna touch. We don't wanna go further there because we know what happens. So we just work with this top layer of soil. So definitely knowing that that top layer of soil needs to be 100% aerobic all the time and realizing that I don't have oxygen there, I can then conclude that all the microbes that are there in this, uh, in this uh, sample is anaerobic. Mm -hmm. So 
most of the time, all the pathogens that actually attack our crops, attack the life that manifests above the ground, um, are always anaerobic uh, pathogens that actually act on that first layer of soil in our roots, attacking all the system of life down there, no? And then also I can see that in this mineral area here, I have a lot of salts diluted because I can see all the different uh, layers, you know, it's very disarticulated, this chroma is not homogenic. <clears throat> Sorry. So I have <clears throat> sorry. So I have um all these circle inside of the another circle of inside of another circle, and then the colors as well. The coloring telling telling me that this soil sample is very um non-homogenic, no, very disarticulated in the structure of the soil. So I have a lot of salts, I have a lot of adding of um, the using of other um, inputs as well. And then the very thinning or even the blur blurring of this enzymatic layer out there tells me that, that everything that has been alive helping to this soil to get again structured is being faded away little by little. And then what happened? This chroma is the compost when we already did our compost and we applied our biodynamic compost a week later. So it's for the 20th of June of the 2018. And that was in March of the 2018. So it was April, May, June, three months later. We, stay, we started with our comp biodynamic compost right away. And then on the 20th of June, after a week of applying that compost, we took the same sample of, of the same area uh, of, the, of the plot and uh, we have this chroma. What do we have here? Yeah, sorry, Natalie, you have a question there or anybody? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, so there's two, it looks like there's two sides. So can you tell us what the two different sides are? Uh, like what those images, um, how they're different? One half on the, on the four, then one on the four. So a chroma test is actually a for, to have a complete picture of it, uh, a chroma test, you made it in, in filter, uh, filter paper discs, no? Mm -hmm. And then you run the chroma and the soil sample through these paper discs. And those paper discs needs, needs to be different, um, uh, how do you say that? Like different filtering capacities. So mm -hmm. the number one is one type of filter disc which is a very a more small pores in the filter disk. And in the number four that we have in the right side, in the, in the, in the number four filter disk, the pores are bigger. So the image expands. And in the number one, the image contracts. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like do, doing a zoom in and a zoom out out mm -hmm. of the same picture, right? Mm -hmm. So we need both of the chromas of the, of the disk in order to say that we have one chroma test mm -hmm. uh, complete. No? Mm -hmm. so, that's so, this is, so this is one on the left and the right is the same soil sample, just one zoomed in and one zoomed out depending on the saturation of the paper that we're using. Exactly, yeah. Awesome. So this is, thank you. Here we have the number one. So this is the filter number one of the chroma test. And this is the number four. Actually, we don't see much here, but here is the number four hidden somewhere there. Mm -hmm. And we have it as well here, here it's clearer. So we mm -hmm. have the number four. So the number four is kind of like the zoom in in order like you go farther and you see more. And then the number one is kind of like the zoom out. So you have the general image. And then that's why I put half and half, you know, in order to have one image where I can have both of the different uh, aspects of that chromatography test. Awesome, super helpful, thank you. So in this one, so the difference here, I mean, it's it's very evident in my opinion, but the coloring is totally different. So it shows me that the 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 structure is clearing itself. It's kind of like cleaning itself up, no? Like all these very 
decomposed and destructured uh, situations are actually getting a little bit more homogenized after just one week of applying biodynamic compost in this area of, of soil, no? And then I can see that there is still a little bit of work that is still being done by all these um, nutrients and, and biology that is being immersed there. And this area here that we see in The center that I told you that it's where the oxygen actually shows up here in the in the center. Uh, it's also kind of like decompressing itself. You know, even though we we see a more darker color in this area here. Oops, that's where I'm at here. Here we see the more darker ring, but in the other one I don't see it in the general picture. I see that here is working. Something is working there in order to the 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 clog actually all these areas as well. So this is just one week after applying biodynamic compost. This is uh, the 23rd of November of the same year. And then we have started working with uh, compost teas as well. After June here that we had our solid biodynamic compost done, we had uh, the work with the uh, compost teas out of that biodynamic compost and then apply to this area of, of, of soil as well. And what we see here in the center, which is the most important part to understand how our, our um, work is actually doing an impact for the good or the bad, we can see that this area is now cleared and open. And we can see this creamy, beautiful, uh, whitish center compared to here, which is not an, non-existent, it's very clogged and closed. And here it's open already. So it means that oxygen finally entered this, uh, this area here. And then the color is getting more power, it's getting more consolidated, more power no? uh, for the color as well. It's more homogenic. And the, the last ring here, if you see in this one, the ring is here. As the as the ring, very darker ring here. The other, another clearer ring around the mineral area is formed there. And then here, the ring is coming all the way up. I mean, everything that needs to be cleared, cleared, it's coming out of the of the situation. So it's pushing whatever needs to be cleared. It's being cleared out, so it's being pushed through the peripheral area. So we see this little line around here that is uh, shows us that it's actually being cleared out, no? And then we can see the, the little lines that as I told you is here, we can still see very, very straight, very rigid lines of micro, my, microbial life here. We see it still very straight, but it's kind of like already kind of like opening, like little pine trees, you now that kind of opens up little spikes and it's like a feather like um, uh, situation and they're getting twisted a little bit more. So this means that the, that the um, aerobial micro, microbiology is actually being installed there as well. So it's winning the battle against the anaerobial, anaerobic um, life there. And this is in the 2nd of July, almost six months, no, like nine months later, after our work and rework, after putting again biodynamic solid compost, again, uh, compost teas and everything. So the situation, as you can see now, it's not a spiky situation with a microbial. It's more of this situation of kind of like a river, no? We can see like, it's very like, uh, I don't know, rivers and creeks and ups and downs, and we have more textures and we can see more layers on top of another layer. And it's kind of like a, a sunny sunny situation, no? And then the, the spikes are not rigid anymore or straight. They are like very widely, more of what life actually is or shows up like a river, no, as I told you. And then it's open. All the feathery situation goes all the way from the center. You know, the, the spikes 
on these ones in the back here, they don't actually touch the center here yet. Mm -hmm. They go all the way from the outside of the, of the chroma and trying to get to the center. But here, if you see it, these spikes or these microbiology already like waving uh, more biodiverse. That means a lot of biodiversity of microbiology is touching the center of the oxygen with all these little feathery thingies. No, it's not like a spike directly. It's like a, it's like a lightning, so to say as well. No, it's like a lightning that comes all the way through the chroma and touches and makes contact with this aerobic situation. And just for illustrating the difference, this is a chroma of a woodland soil, no? And in order for us to understand as farmers or people that do agriculture or, or, or grows crops, we will never be able to achieve this in an agricultural land. We will need to leave that agricultural land in order to be restored by itself, if not restore it ourselves by reforesting and helping a forest to grow, which is something that, yeah, som sometimes is, is uh, putting in the balance uh, our agricultural work uh, against nature. It's never comparable, no, for sure. But then here we see how all these spiky situations doesn't exist anymore. It's all fulfilled. All the microbial activity is completely full and it's showing and it's expressing. And then there are different layers here. There are like layers of layers of layers of information going on. And then all these little dark um, spots that we see at the end of it, right where the microbial, microbial uh, life shows up, it's called humus, no? Humus, for me, is the spirit of the soil. It's where the most, it's like where the library of eons of time is stored and what tells nature how to act and how to be and how to express itself as a forest, something that doesn't actually exist and will never exist in an agricultural land, unfortunately, because it needs still a lot of succession of hierarchies uh, of manifestation of different uh, layers of, of life, no? And here we see that, we see humus, we see all these little clouds, more dark, and then there is no spiky situation. And then the center is huge. You see the power and the potency of the center actually. So the potency of this creamy center is huge and the potency actually shown here, no, like with this even golden golden um, circle around this creamy means that it, the power and the amount of vitality that is there is huge. No, it's something that we will never get to do with our uh, agricultural situation. And then you can see here all the different layers and textures and how rivers are created within this beautiful image. And then how the little humus clouds shows up. And this is just for our for, for us to understand our um even our aim, no, not to become greater than nature, because we will never be greater, greater than nature as what nature does by itself. Uh, and this is pretty much what we can attain for an agricultural situation. We can even work more. And if we keep doing it and we keep working with it and using our compost and using our preparations and using our permacultural and our green manures and taking care of these 10 inches of soil for the rest of our lives, we get obviously better and better situations in the vitality realm. But definitely achieving this is just letting that piece of land mm. alone <laughs> and uh, helping it to, to be full of trees and life and biodiversity, you know. Yeah. That's amazing, Gabby. I love uh, the images and how you walked us in such detail through that, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the, those images. And so you use chromatography to measure and to give you feedback um, how 
your soils responding to the different practices that you use, like the compost teas and the um, the biodynamic compost and the different permadynamic practices that you use. So can you share with us some of the permadynamics that you use and how, um, cause I think what people, sometimes there's a lot of disconnect because there's like, oh, there's biodynamics and there's Korean natural farming and there's permaculture and there's organics. And um, what's also true is that there's a lot of the same in a lot of the different practices and you bringing the and amplifying the the permit permaculture and biodynamics together is a is a powerful journey so we'd love to thank you yeah i mean of course um yeah <laughs> chromatography is just the way that i interpret the language of the earth no, that I can actually understand if my practices, if what I'm actually putting my energy into as my my work as a farmer is actually creating vitality or is diminishing vitality. No, because sometimes our decisions mm -hmm. are not always perfect and not are not always accurate, and we have to acknowledge that as well. We get to do a lot of mistakes all the time, and uh, actually, this is the only way chromatography in which I can be uh, supported in my work, no? that I know that I'm actually becoming more fluent, more, more experimented in understanding this language of the earth. So it gives me the certainty that I'm doing things so right. No? And then this is what my model of perma, uh, permadynamics actually looks for or is about. It's an experimental strawberry field that I did for two years and a half in um, El, Va El, El Valle del Duero, the Duero Valley in Mexico. So it's in, in the region of Michoacan. It's a very, um, it was, used to be a very fertile, very vital area of Mexico. It's the second largest productive um, area of Mexico, but lately it's been deployed very widely as you can see no this is the type of land that we have already it's just clay drained eroded compacted soil no so we have a very sad situation there are no more trees around it there is still a lot of water very superficial that we just dig a hole like uh, 10 feet maybe less and we have water very superficial so it's still a good area for 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 agriculture but still we've managed <laughs> to diminish it in a very uh, fast ratio no and it's very mm -hmm. sad and uh so i i rented this land for for a period of two years and a half and i did this this project we started with bringing water this water we still have the beautiful uh possibility to have source water from uh, very close from there and we have a ranch a neighbor a neighbor in the fourth side that use chemicals in a very wide uh, range no they very bad chemicals as well and then um, we we started with our permacultural uh, practices of green manuring no we needed a lot of rounds of green manure and we all understand why maybe not everybody but we need roots in our soil in order to tell or 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 accompany our soil into its its original process of putting the soil to work because that's the main idea of why nature actually is nature she's mm -hmm. always working and she works through the roots and um so we need to put roots in the soil <laughs> in order to tell the soil okay we're going to start working with you so we put a lot of seeds this kind of seeds, no? This is mungo, uh, bean, and uh, hanamargo, visia sativa, and uh, sunflower, and um, chickpeas, and all different types, and mustards, and all these different types of uh, different, all the, all the variety, no? Uh, legumes, and, uh, and grasses, and all the different types of, of uh, varieties of diversity. Then we started making a, a, our soil a little bit, the possibility for the actually 
the seeds to be able to enter the soil because the soil is just a big plug of clay like that. And we needed to break it a little bit. We needed to use one of these in the beginning and then making these rows in order to irrigate with the superficial water that we have here. So we just let it in through these rows there. We just let the water in and the land is a little with a, some pendant there. And um, so the water just flows through the whole thing already with our seeds uh, in there. No? So this is the first week after we planted the seeds. Then after three weeks, we started having some sprouting there. It's very dry, very sad situation, but the sprouting is starting to work there. So here they are, the little sprouts, and we start composting. We start our, our compost. Actually, this first round of, of green manure, we just let it for another week here, and then we mix it with the soil again. And I used uh, preparation biodynamic uh, compost, uh, sorry, uh, barrel compost. Oh my God. My, my English is, is mixed. But I use barrel compost in order to mix this first round of green manures with the soil and give it more information to this land, to this soil, in order to work with these roots, with these germs, which is where more energy and more nitrogen in the vegetal form is in that moment, at that moment of, of, of the germ. You know? And then immediately, Right there, when I was about to incorporate this first round, I started my compost. So we have coffee husks and uh, straw and different things, very nice. And I used my biodynamic compost preparations in my compost and then a lot of water and then stirring some of these uh, barrel compost as well in order to inoculate plus the whole set of biodynamic preparations into the compost. And then this is the second and the third round. You see the amount of germination after the first one, which was pretty low and pretty scattered like that. The, the third round was already covering much more and the vitality of the plants was bigger. And then little by little, we started having conversations. No? What bugs? Mm -hmm are actually attacking those green manures, why, what type of pests. And we started uh, talking and understanding what are you wanting, what, what do you want to clean up, no? And they, the soil, the pests wanted to clean up the mustard and the mustard is mostly uh, absorbing all what is um, phos uh, phosphorum and uh, manganese and ma ma manganese, no magnesium, sorry, excess of all these minerals. So I understood that those bugs wanting to eat or clean up all the mustard. So I needed to put more mustard in the soil, in the soil in order to clean all these minerals, no? So it's kind of like the language that you start and the conversation that you start having with the soil. What do you need? Why is it attacking this plant more than, and that's why green manures help you to understand and to start this dialogue and this conversation with no and little by little I started seeing all these guys here the 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 worms coming back into the soil because in a big clump of clay <laughs> there are no worms no and then little by little all the roots as I told you roots it's the only thing that is going to help you declog and uh, uh, decompose all this uh, erosion situation in the in the soil helping all these uh, worms to get into it through the roots and getting putting the air that we were talking with the with the chromatography, which is the most important thing because you want aerobic microbiology in this soil. No, and then little by little, uh, starting to create these conversations, incorporating all that back into the soil. It's kind of like homeopathic uh, healing for the soil. No, in order for the mustard to absorb all these nutrients, retransform these nutrients into what the plant needs to grow, and then reincorporating this mustard with all these nutrients in excess already transformated into something is kind of like giving it the same, but in an opposite uh, in an opposite form, so to say. So it gives the soil the possibility to drain all these excesses of salts, of chemicals, of 
of situations that are not good for the soil there. So this is what green manures are my everything in order to start this conversation with the soil. And then you here, this is the, the fourth round of, 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 of uh, green manures already. And we see already the texture of this soil completely changed. It's not at all, it's dry already. It's been like, I don't know, maybe a month since the last irrigation we had. And the clump situation is not clumpy anymore. So it's more of a soil, the color even changed as well, just with four rounds of, 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 of um, green manures and, and uh, barrel compost, you know, mm -hmm. and understanding each round of green manure, what plant is needed more than the others. So adjusting your seed mix every time. Mm -hmm. And then I and Gabby, with your green manures, um, are you so you're you're planting it and the one the first one you brought up and it was about a week or so and then you put that in and then how quickly are you putting in the next green manure after that? Right away after I right away after I incorporate it when the green manure is about uh I don't know five inches of growth mm -hmm. right away when most of the seeds are already germinated and a little bit big but not big that actually grows a lot of leaves because I want this vegetal nitrogen situation to be at, at the maximum, you know, mm -hmm. for, for most of the, so I let it grow for about uh, five inches most uh, tops. And then I incorporate it back into the soil with the, with the flatten or the barrel compost. And then the next day I put the seeds, irrigate, and then let it, let it sit for another month or another month and a half, depending on the growth and the mix that I um, balance or rebalanced, depending on the growth of that. And then that's one round after the second round, the third, fourth round, until mm -hmm. I understand that the soil is in a better situation. And then I do yeah. my trauma. Yeah. Uh, what, what is green manure? Oh, green manure. <laughs> Well, green manure is is like a, a manure that we know, like a, a cow manure or any kind of manure, but this is vegetal manure, so we call it. So this is the this is the green manure, the, the five inches of vegetal growth that actually is going to help improve the health or the structure of your soil. Which is pretty much what we use manures, manures, uh, animal manures for, no? Mm -hmm. But and green manure, yeah. I was gonna say, what do we use the green manure for? What are the benefits of using it? Yeah, that giving the soil the information in order to restore, restru restructuring itself, it, in order to give it vitality information to put it back in the soil in order to restart ignite life again and give okay. the possibilities for all these to happen no right and so another common word is cover crop i see my dad just yeah. put that into the into the um chat the, the thing with the cover crop is the cover crop you want it to stay there covering the soil which is another use no for for the green manure is just actually using it as an information to put it back into the soil in order to ignite life again mm -hmm use accompanied with the information that you do with your own will no you do the preparations you put your will along with the green manure back into the soil and then you give extra information for that soil to ignite you know and then the cover crops you want them to stay there for covering that uh, ignition that already happened you know so it's like a second phase so to awesome. say Okay. And what tools are you using to put the green manure back into the soil? A rotovator or rotopiller mm -hmm. is the best. No, or in the case that you don't have, just use a regular plow, but very superficial. Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like just passing the plow through in order to see that the green manure is actually being uh, mixed with a little bit of soil. It's the superficial. Superficial, yeah. Yeah. And this can be done on large, um, like large acreages or small, smaller garden plots. Yeah, every everywhere. You can everywhere. use a manual, a manual um, rotovator or cultivator. Awesome. You no. Know? So you have, and then 
a lot of all these wild things that I didn't even invite to the party just arrived you know, by themselves, along with my Vicia Sativa and my other guys. You no, know, they started just to sprouting a lot of all different types and variety of amazing other plants that needed to be there in order to potentize that vitality you know, that is being generated. And then after that, I started the management of the crop after knowing that I have done a good job starting or installing this information of, of vitality in the soil, of, of, of cleaning it and clearing all the maybe pesticides, all the chemical situation that was there for so many years. I think I managed to clean that, I could say in less than a year, no? The abuse of decades of, of agrochemicals. We can be not completely 100% certain, but very much certain that you are doing a good job clearing that up as much as possible in order to start a crop, no? For, from the get-go. And then I put my mulch, which is just a straw. And then my, my strawberry seedlings, I installed my irrigation system. And then I put my, my straw and then all my seedlings, my seedlings there, no, all along. And the strawberries is just a terrible situation. I don't know if you guys know, but there is a company called Driscoll's. I don't know if I'm able to say that or not. But those guys are working very hard in this valley of Mexico that I work this project here. That's why I used the, the strawberries because this is pretty much what in this area is mainly uh, planted. So, and they are completely doing terrible things with it because they have patented the plant of strawberries because they've been uh, manipulating them. So it's, it's a whole kind of like a mafia, big ag situation uh, in a terrible way. So I wanted to make that, that, that's why I did this experimental strawberry field because I wanted to show that even doing pretty much, it looks like a regular monoculture, uh, do it or, or, or managed in a, in a chemical way, but not. <laughs> this is the only thing. So I wanted to see what happened. If actually the chemical situation was better than this one, or if this one was better than the chemical situation. And the results were awesome. So uh, just by doing the mulching, which everybody, all my neighbors use these plastics now of uh, covering the mulch, uh, they call it mulching, but it's just plastic, not uh, organic or vegetal mulch, no? And then I started using my preparations. I did the three kings on the 6th of January in order to protect against the whole neighbor situation that we're using all these very potent uh, chemicals and substances. And then I start just observing. And I start observing that the plants were growing beautifully without using any chemicals, no? Just being um, conscious, conscious having the conscience of what I've done beforehand in order to clean that soil and giving the possibility for whatever plant it is, because that plant, actually those seedlings come from a chemical facility that actually makes these plantings in order to respond to chemicals, no? to agrochemicals. And uh, so I didn't use them and I thought, okay, let's see what happens. Maybe they won't live for more than two months, but We'll see. So they started growing very healthy and incredible. They started fruiting and uh, little by little, the soil and I did my compost and the soil and everything and the mushrooms and the whole ecology, the whole system or ecosystem was very much alive, you know? And then I started having these beautiful strawberries and the strawberries were amazing because a chemical strawberry doesn't last more than two days. If you don't put it in a freezer or in a fridge, or if you do something with it, it will just rot in a couple of days because it's just water and chemicals, uh, the strawberry. And then the strawberries that I, used, that I used to grow could last more than a week in the outside, you know, in the, just letting them there. 
and the taste was different and the texture was different and the color of the leaves of the plant were different and everything was different and uh, and the, and then i have i have uh different seedlings as well in between the the no i have a sunflower and then here it's a tomatoes plant and then there are corns and then different types of le legume legumes as well and things that were planted there in between with the strawberries and people were telling me like you're crazy and i was like yes i am i don't care and then some onions and some here and there and then i did my viral compost and i started spraying viral compost and and this is the situation with my neighbors no and the pests as you can see here, the pest, the red spider, it's just eating it up, the whole thing. So they need to rush their crops in order to produce as much as they invested in money in order to produce in less than three months after they put the seedlings in the soils. Because other way, if they don't produce enough in three months after they put the seedlings, the situation is that the, the pests just eat up all the crop. And this is the terrible situation. As you can see here, there is nothing left. And I lasted for two years round with my own, with my, with my, the, the same seedlings, no? For two years, they lasted. These guys couldn't make it for three months before the pests would just eat the whole thing up. And this is the scenario of my neighbors. And this is me, no? Mm -hmm. So I think that the situation completely changed it's a beautiful area just you can just go and pick the strawberries and eat them right away and i used to go with my neighbors and tell them okay just grab a strawberry and eat it and the guys were not no i'm not doing that because i know what i put in my strawberries and i was like what are you talking about how come you can sell that and knowing that you're selling poison you won't eat your own strawberries no and i was like come to my come come to my orchard I, I give you some strawberries and they were very impacted. But the situation is that it's the same. It didn't change the mind now or the, the big agriculture model is so strong, so potent that uh, our practices are still very little compared to that. But still the experiment was beautiful for me and it was a very reassuring um, situation of what am I doing in this world or why am I that crazy that I keep doing what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. that completely gave me the sense of, uh, of, of the, this is recycling after two years, we recycle, we, we dry them up because the plants unfortunately are modified to a way that they don't produce enough after three rounds of, of flowering. So they, they just don't produce any more fruit. <laughs> it's there, they're like uh, genetic, genetically modified to do that. So it's very sad. And then we had to dry them up, recycle again, and restart all our cycle. And this is when I stopped because I moved back here to San Miguel to start my ranch and my life project. So life goes on, things happened, and I hope that you guys liked it. And this is pretty much what I yeah. what I do. No? It's amazing, uh, Gabby. James has asked, instead of tilling in the green manure, can we use chop and drop? Chop and drop and leave it there on the surface? Yeah. The well, it's, it's not even possible since the seedlings are just like five or less than that because they're very, you want them to be very, very, um, how do you say that? Babies, baby germs, mm -hmm. you know? Barely just sprouting so this is where the most energy is available out of the seedling and the 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 the, the vegetal nitrogen the nitrogen in the vegetal form in the etheric form so which is pretty much what the plants actually need from the biodynamic perspective you want the etheric nitrogen coming into the soil structure in order to reconform it we don't we don't want the carbon or the uh carbonated nitrogen as the plant starts growing and starts creating the the skin how do you say that the the, the cork of the the bark the bark of the of the plant you don't want it to actually start creating the that lignin form of of 
of, of carbon. No, you want as much vegetal nitrogen as possible before the carbon actually starts kicking in in the process of the growth of the plant. So mm. this is pretty much why you don't even can can chop it. You have to incorporate it actually with the soil in order for the soil to absorb these um, vegetal nitrogen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same with them when we're sprouting sprouts to eat them right for our own for our own health and well-being the the yeah. sprouts that are um the reason the sprouts are so powerful is the energy and the nutrients in those baby sprouts when we eat them and it's the same thing that you're talking about for the earth when exactly. we when they go beyond that sprouted stage the nutritional value completely changes and so mm -hmm. we want that core vitality okay. going back into the earth um charlene had a question let me just um bring that up um did you use 500 bd biodynamic preparation 500 and other preps as well yeah. as the compost teas okay yeah actually when i when i get those strawberry seedlings for instance in this last model i submerged the whole tray of seedlings in the 500 preparation in order to give it the information of changing the way that those seedlings were brought up to life in a chemical way in order to tell them, okay, we're going to work like this. And then I submerge those seedlings into the 500 and then I put them in the ground uh, after applying as well uh, viral compost and the situation. And then two weeks later, I planted those seedlings in the ground. I sprayed the 501. Mm. And Gabby, when you're drenching the seeds in the 500, are you planting them right away after that? Yeah right away. Okay. And what are some of the other pra permadynamic practices that you use for crop vitality? So we've talked about green manure. Um, yeah. Seed, the water. The seed bathing you're talking about, right? Seed bathing is the dropping the, this, this. The seed bathing, that too. And the water restructuring of, uh, of uh, yeah, passing it through. In the my irrigation system, I had magnets in the vault in order to open the the flow of water into the into the so i wanted to create this vortex of water within the the flow of the water in my irrigation system as well in order to keep when i used for instance the the compost teas that i made out of my biodynamic compost i want these barrel these compost teas to keep being dynamite or or how do you say that in the vortex situation while they're being irrigated into my plants. I don't want to miss this uh, flow of, of energy. So uh, water uh, reorder, how do you say that? Restructuring of the water um, through, through magnets as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do that when you're applying it? Yeah, with the, in my irrigation system. So okay. I have the magnets. Uh, right after the 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 vaults that mm -hmm. you you open the vault in order to cover a certain area of your crop with this irrigation. So I had the magnets all the way through the the main line mm -hmm. before coming into the tubes that actually goes into each row of of the crop. So I have magnets all the way in the mo in the main lines after the vaults. No, that's awesome. And then that's a lot um, of multi well. Yeah. A lot of what, sorry? Mulching with the straw, as you could see, which is very important to keep the soil covered. Yeah, you have a lot of straw on those strawberries. You know, I was when I was in Saskatchewan for the last four years, that's what I used on our strawberries as well, is the straw for mulching. And it's amazing what it did for that soil and for those that's plants. It. Yeah, it, it just blew my mind because what was so fascinating, and you can tell, and I'd love to hear what your experience on this is, is... um the the areas where the straw it was well mulched with straw you move that straw and we didn't have rain for weeks and weeks and weeks in Saskatchewan and so super dry and you'd move that straw and it still looked moist like there was this rich dark soil underneath that so straw and I'm not kidding you like inches away from where that straw ended and it, it was complete it, the soil was completely dry so is it like that for you as well yeah, pretty much. And then something that amazed me is that I used 
different types of straw mm -hmm. during the during the time uh long time or the period that I work with it and then when I used the corn straw yeah. I realized that there was a fungi situation that a symbiosis some symbiosis created with um with the straw uh fungi that was created for the decomposition or the decay of that straw on the ground that it, it created the bauveria uh, fungi you know that you've heard of that it's an entho entomopathogen uh, fungi that actually attacks the 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 insects with a hard shell in the outside, okay. and they get into the insect, the the fungi, the bauveria, and then started yeah killing it from the inside, and then the fungi actually grows through the insect, and it's a very amazing <laughs> protector against pests, and uh, I it was a very amazing. Some symbiosis now or some symbiotic yeah. relation. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. Um, how do you make the, the straw from the corn? Is it through a shredder? Yeah, I mean, uh, once you harvest your your corn, you get all the most of the of the plant there, you chop it, and then you get the the how do you call it? Uh, bales. Mm -hmm. oh, you get the bales and then you pass it through a uh, uh, chopper and then you get your corn uh, mulch. That's really cool. Yeah, fantastic, right, Walton? It's amazing. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, Gabby is putting together a chromatography workshop and we're going to help her amplify that. So if you would like to know when that workshop comes out, type a one in the chat and we'll email you details about that. You'll be the first to know and the first um, people in line to sign up for that. And uh, so make sure also um, a, a lot of people in this room already are on our newsletter list. It's connect at heartandsoulmagazine.com. So if um, you have not received emails from us before and you're brand new here, make sure that connect at heartandsoulmagazine.com is in your inbox and not going to your spam or your junk mail. So that's really important too. So lots of ones coming in there, Gabby. It's very exciting. I know that uh, chromatography is one of my, my, uh, my favorite things and I don't know, I don't know how to do it necessarily, but I've always been really fascinated about it. So I can't wait to learn more about it. Gabby, one of the things that I would really like to amplify, which you touched on, which I think is just so powerful is is just, is the life of the soil and you really honing in on that magical space of putting the green manure back into the soil when it's five inches or less mm. um, high, because I think we graze over that a lot. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> we graze over that a lot. And, and, you know, it's, it's green manure, it's a cover crop and we do it because it's putting more nutrients into the ground or it, you know, it's increasing the organic matter and it's yeah. helping us um, sequester carbon and doing all these things. And so can you just talk a little bit more of that connection to life force and what that feels like and looks like for you and your practice? Well, actually when you get the possibility to give information to the soil. It's like now, we're communicating. Sometimes we're understanding each other, sometimes not, because maybe it's my bad English, I don't know. But there are maybe some barriers for the communication. But when you give maybe a, a word or a specific thing, people just get it. No matter if you can explain it perfectly or not, there are things that actually just pass through all these barriers. No? And for nature, those barriers are non-existent. So as long as you work with information and then you stop thinking in our rational way of like, we need organic matter and we need to sequester carbon and we need, because all that are our rational concepts that we need to manage in order to say that we're doing things properly. And then this is the things that never let you rest because then you are missing something and then you are needing more of these nutrients and then you're needing more of that and then it never let you rest. So you are never at ease with uh, what you sense and what you feel that you're doing with nature. So 
working with nature is all about the information that you are certain that you are giving to it. And then once you pass the message, which is the most important thing, just get the message of vitality into your soil. And when is the more vital moment for a seedling to be present or to be, or how does the vitality of a seedling manifest is in this moment, mm. no? And then as long as you know that that's the most vital moment for any seedling, then you put it in the ground, you know that you're passing that message of vitality of ignite, igniting life again in that soil. And this is the most important message that you need to actually spread to every activity or every practice that you do for, for when you manage a crop, where you manage a garden, where you manage whatever piece or patch of land. So the mm. most important thing is how to ignite life again. And then passing that message is the only thing important. Then everything will come as a consequence for that. The sequestration mm. of carbon, the, equilib the equilibrium of all these mineral, these regulations, everything will be adjusted because mm. we are not more intelligent than nature is. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Charlene said she's still concerned about how to superficially incorporate the manure when all she has a, is a tiller. Is that okay? Just using the tiller, but just yeah. using it like shallow? Yeah. The tiller will completely mix the, the green manure with the, the soil, the first layer of soil. Remember, we don't need to work beyond three or four inches of soil when we are uh, incorporating this green manure. Mm -hmm. And Gabby, I think uh, I think the pain that a lot of people might be feeling is there's so much talk about doing no dig and tilling is killing. So can you just help soothe that? That well, that, that that's narrative? something that gives me the chills as well. But as I told you, as agriculture practitioners, farmers, gardeners, our impact as humans will never be the impact we want, you know? And uh, because we, as I told you, we are not more clever or more intelligent than, than nature. So as long as we are doing a practical work with the land and working with the soil or growing something or doing a garden or whatever, we will always create impact. That's a human, constitution that's a human way Plus, of being mm -hmm. yeah yeah we cannot avoid impact in our environment so it, it will depend on us on how that impact will actually create whether a positive impact or a very negative impact so the tools that we have now that we as humans already have created uh, we need to be certain of how to use them, no? And I use the tilling only in those first three, four inches of soil in order not to touch deeper the soil because this is the part of the soil that actually needs to be restored. This is the part where we are able to create this interconnection or this dialogue. This is the only area that our impact should be very conscious and very aware of what we're doing. And that's why using the green manure and then tilling it in order to incorpor incorporate it with this very fine layer of soil is the only way we have in order to put the information back into the soil. Other way, it will take us, how long does it take nature to restore itself? Maybe, I don't know, maybe two years, maybe five, depends on how eroded and how, uh, destruct, uh, de de decompose that uh, patch of land, land yeah. is, no? Yeah. But definitely, if we want to do something about it, we need to understand what we're doing it and why, and what's going to be the impact of that. We need to put information in the soil. Right. It actually feels, when you're talking about it, it feels more and more powerful. And like, um, it's like when we uh, might have dead skin, like dead dried up skin and we might use a loofah to clean that area, to nourish that area, to wake it up. And um, that's what it almost feels like that green manure is doing just to that top layer of 
of soil. It's not, it's not necessarily going deep and tearing it up. Yeah. It's, it's nourishing it. It's nourishing it. Yeah. It's like applying lotion or as you said, like scrapping sometimes when you are uh, having a, a rash or I don't know. No, mm -hmm. but we need to work as well with our skin and the soil is the skin of the earth for it sure. Is. Yeah, we need to. Is. Yeah, so cool. So um, I, before we wrap up, Gabby, I just w would love to just touch on the like, chromatography one more time um, and this workshop that you're putting together. And what could we expect to learn in, the, in that? Will we learn how to read it, how to do yeah. it? Well, first of all, we'll learn how to make it mm -hmm. at home or in our very tiny little lab at home and um, how, do, how to make it or let it process properly because it takes a while, definitely, how to process the samples, how to make the chromas and then how to let it process. So it's a complex, so to say, uh, uh, process, no? Mm -hmm. Long process. And then how to read it for sure, which is the most important thing. And then how to use it for what, what the applications of a chroma actually are, what are the methodologies for, for learning the language of the earth through chromatography, you know, which is the, the most important tool that I have. <laughs> to I just love happen. it, learning the language of the earth. That's beautiful. So um, these conversations are, Heart and Soul has been ho is, is hosting them and we are currently, we've been offering them for free. We would like to be able to give our speakers an honorarium, though, for um, for their time and their expertise, and to cover the costs of putting these on. So, we welcome donations. So, if you're able to give a, like ten dollars or um, or more than that, you're we welcome them, and we will pass those on to the people who are helping put this these on together, and to our speakers. And if you know a sponsor, like a a business or an organization that would like to help sponsor the interviews, then we also welcome those so that we can so we can um, share in the gift economy and keep the circulation and the gratitude going through not just the the time and and showing up, but also helping people mm, pay for the things that they need to pay for to make these things happen, like putting straw on their strawberry plants and irrigation out and getting people in their fields to work with them and putting on the workshops, all the things that, that uh, take that exchange of energy. So we thank you for the donations and we thank you for your time and we thank you for your questions and we thank you for just being here today and for the amazing, awesome humans you are, because uh, just um, I feel like that we are the green manure of the ethos and we are the energy that is part of the awakening of planet Earth and of humanity into our next, our, our, as we continue to evolve and to heal this Earth together. So thank you for being here and wishing you a big love and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, Gabby. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you. And thank you, thank you all for hosting. You. So you can go and follow her on Facebook and you can also find her on Instagram. There, her both of her links are there. So give her some love. She's also available to do a speaking engagements, and she speaks at conferences around the world. So watch for her at those. And if you know somebody who's looking for a speaker in biodynamics or chromodynamics or chromatography, then keep her at top of mind. 